Um, so good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Neta Gruber Perry, and I'm happy to welcome you uh, to the launch of the Israel Innovations, uh, Israel Innovation Authority's International Healthcare Collaboration Program, uh, which offers an opportunity for Israeli healthcare companies to connect to conduct joint R&D and pilot projects in collaboration with leading health centers around the world. Uh, so we've had more than 500 participants, uh, registrants here today, and we are, I'm seeing the numbers increasing um, uh, now. So this is incredible. And it also shows both, you know, the strength of the Israeli health tech ecosystem, as well as its thirst for collaboration. So I would like to thank our great partners at the health centers, uh, at the participating health centers, for their continued support and interest in Israeli innovation. We have with us the Charité, Hartford Healthcare, Mayo Clinic, the Northern Health Science Alliance, the NHSA, and Thomas Jefferson University Hospital. Huge thanks also to the Israeli Trade Mission in Berlin, to the UK Israel Tech Hub, and to our partners in Health IL, the health tech innovation ecosystem in Israel. <clears throat> so now, uh, without further ado, I would like to pass on uh, the stage to Dor Bean, the CEO of the Israel Innovation Authority. Dor, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Neta. Uh, I'm very happy to be here and uh, more happy to see the number of participants uh, in the webinar. I, I chose, I believe, uh, the demand and the need uh, for uh, this uh, program. Um, you know that uh, the Israeli high tech is uh, very successful uh, worldwide. Uh, with a record year in uh, two, uh, 2021, uh, but also 2022, at least uh, so far, looks as a very good uh, year, despite all the turmoils. Uh, but one of the objectives for us in the Innovation Authority is to make uh, the Israeli uh, high tech more diversified. Uh, if we look upon the investments in the high tech last year, uh, something like 65 or 70 percent of the money went to the classical uh, high tech sectors like uh, enterprise uh, software and fintech and cyber and communication. And we would like to see more uh, sectors uh, rising and becoming uh, uh, world class and leading in their uh, pack uh, globally. And one of uh, the certain candidates is uh, the sector of uh, health tech. Uh, we believe that uh, Israel has some uh, very good assets uh, in the health sector that can uh, really become the infrastructure for uh, groundbreaking innovation and uh, lots of uh, ventures and uh, hopefully also uh, many uh, unicorns and uh, large companies that will be uh, growing here in Israel. Just to mention a few of those uh, assets, uh, one is a very strong academia and uh, research, basic research, applied research in the areas uh, of health. The second is uh, a very advanced uh, health system, uh, the HMOs, the hospitals. Uh, all the records are digitized for uh, decades now of all the population. So this is a great asset uh, to work with. Uh, there is the asset of uh, the classical uh, high tech in terms of uh, very uh, big and uh, sophisticated investors community and uh, great entrepreneurs uh, that uh, have a lot of drive uh, to succeed. Uh, so all of those are, are very good grounds uh, for uh, entrepreneurship, for uh, groundbreaking uh, ventures. Uh, in a few areas of health tech. Uh, obviously, there, are, there were successes in pharma, in medical devices. Uh, we in the Innovation Authority believe a lot in uh, bioconvergence, uh, the convergence of uh, biology or life sciences with uh, software and electronics, creating, uh, you know, I think in this case, only the imagination is the limit, uh, things that uh, are very hard to imagine. Uh, but anyhow, uh, it's not enough to create ventures. Uh, those ventures also need uh, the ground to scale up. And this is uh, one of the purposes of uh, this program, the ability to do pilots in uh, leading uh, medical centers abroad 
in order to uh, have the first uh, experience, the first customer, uh, learn from uh, this uh, pilot, improve the product, and then uh, scale up. And this is why we believe this uh, program is a real opportunity for uh, Israeli companies. I'm very happy uh, that we managed to uh, partner with uh, such uh, leading uh, medical uh, centers. Uh, I think uh, Aneta already mentioned the names, Charité, Hartford, Mayo Clinic, Thomas Je Jefferson uh, University Hospital, the NHSA from the UK. So really uh, the best places anyone can think of uh, to uh, pilot a new solution, a new product, a new technology. Uh, and I believe this is the reason for uh, the number of uh, participants on this uh, uh, webinar. I want to thank these uh, partners uh, for uh, willing to for the willingness to work together. I'm sure they will benefit uh, from this partnership uh, as well. So I would like to uh, wish everyone uh, success. It's going to be a very competitive uh, process, uh, but I'm sure the outcome would be would be great. So good luck and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gore. Um, so let's get back here. Um, okay, so let's go over quickly over our uh, webinar agenda. So we've already heard the opening remarks uh, from Gore Bean. Thank you very much. Next on, we're going to um, uh, share some information about the International Health Tech Call for Proposals, how it's built, the, the process, the funding opportunities. Uh, then we're going to, to, to um, pass the stage on to the health centers for them to provide um, information about how they work, what their areas of interest are, uh, what sort of their collaboration they're looking for with Israeli companies. Uh, then we have our partners from Health IL um, talk to us about how to build a successful collaboration with hospitals. Then we will have uh, the Israel Innovation Authority's uh, business operations to um, tell us a bit practically about how to submit an application the first stage, and then we'll have time for Q&A. Um, I remind you that the whole webinar will be recorded and we will receive the recording uh, afterwards, and you are also able to ask us questions in the chat and we'll do our best to answer um, as we go. We have we are many people here, so if we don't get a chance to you know, answer to all of your questions, we'll be available afterwards as well. Um, okay, so diving in. The International Health Tech Collaboration Program, as we said, it's a unique opportunity to partner with leading international health centers in R&D and pilot projects. Uh, the successful applicants will receive a grant of up to 50% of the approved budget. Uh, and we don't have a specific cap for the size of the project. It would vary according to um, you know, the, the project that will be designed uh, with the partners. We have five leading health centers and networks from USA, UK, and Germany with us, all with world-leading um, world-class facilities for testing, validating, and co-development of uh, a variety of disruptive technologies and products with the health sector. Um, and they will share a bit of their interests in a minute. Um, so about our funding procedures, uh, we found it very uh, important to be transparent and to share uh, upfront so that, you know, you as, as uh, uh, Israeli health tech companies, we know uh, what to expect. Uh, there are two main tracks uh, one is the R&D collaboration. In this track, um, an IP share agreement is reached between both partners. Co-development is done and new IP is created. In this track, the, expensive, the expenses of the international partner, i.e. the um, healthcare, uh, health tech, sorry, the, the, um, uh, the international uh, uh, health center uh, cannot be approved as part of the budget submitted to the Israel Innovation Authority's funding. So we can later on give some examples for uh, expenses that can be approved and cannot be approved, but it's important to uh, highlight this up front. Then we have a second track. This is a pilot collaboration track. So here, no new IP is created. Um, there is no joint development, but rather uh, the Israeli company is, is coming to test and to validate its own existing technology and it maintains IP ownership. Um, in this case, the partner, the international health uh, uh, <laughs> A partner can um, its expensive can be recognized as part of the approved budget. Um, it will be regarded as a subcontractor, and again, will have no uh, IP ownership. And when ten percent of and more or more of the approved budget is used to, to by the Israeli company to fund the subcontractor expenses abroad, 
Then the Israel Education Authority uh, percentage of support for budgeting for the subcontractor expenses shall not exceed 30%. I know it sounds a bit confusing. Um, again, if you have specific questions for us afterwards, uh, do let us know, but this is kind of the, the framework uh, for funding. Um, and now I want to pass on uh, the stage to Alan Hoffman, my colleague of the International Collaboration Division to uh, present the process and the timeline. Alan, please. Hi, Neta, thank you very much. Uh, so about the, the process of the, this call for proposal, we are opening the, the call uh, today uh, and the call will be uh, uh, part of two phases uh, of, of application or submission. First one is the express of interest submission, uh, the EOI uh, that you need to uh, submit until the uh, 14th of November, 2022. Uh, this uh, form, uh, it's a six uh, pages uh, form where you need to summarize uh, the proposal of an R&D or a pilot project uh, in partnership with one of the, um, of, of the health centers. Uh, and then uh, there will be a process of uh, pre-screening of uh, the proposals by the health centers where they're going to decide with which one of the companies they are willing to uh, pursue uh, this kind of partnership. And the uh, results of this uh, process will be uh, until uh, February, 2023. From then, it uh, starts the second phase of this program where uh, every company that was selected by uh, each uh, hospital will uh, start designing and discussing the terms of collaboration and the project in partnership with the health center. We'll also uh, write and, and design the, the, the business plan, the milestones and the project and the submission uh, of the full proposal to the Israel National Authority funding that the deadline is the 21, 21st of June, 2023. It's very important to use this time in order to discuss uh, the, the, the project and uh, the uh, activities that you're going to pursue uh, together with the health center, as well as the terms of, of collaboration. And the final results uh, by the Israel National Authority after the evaluation process uh, it, uh, and, and the decision of the evaluation committee will be in September 2023. Uh, that's, that's it. As I said, two different phases. First one where each company needs to uh, submit an expert of interest and a, a proposal for the collaboration. The decision by the health centers will be until February 2023. And then uh, the submission of the full proposal to the Israel National Fund Authority funding until the 21st of June, 2023. So thank you very much. Uh, and I give you, uh, Neta, the same. Great, thank you very much, Alan. So um, next up, um, we are very much interested to hear what the leading health centers are looking for. Um, so uh, first up, I'll, I'll invite Hannah Hassor, uh, Hassor and uh, Louise Reuter uh, from the Charité to present. Please, I'll stop sharing and you can. Stop. Thank you. Thank you so much, dear Netta. Um, hope you can see my presentation. So, okay, perfect. So dear IIA, dear uh, cooperating partners, dear startups, it's a really a great pleasure to be a part of the second call. Since uh, through the last call, we have really experienced that Israel is truly a country of innovation. So uh, we are very, uh, we're looking forward just to get to know all the innovative solutions uh, you are going to approach uh, to us this time. So my name is Hannah Hastor, and as Neta already said, along with my colleague Louisa Reuter, we are going to guide you today to the institution of Charité and uh, through the support that we can offer you in this project. Sorry, it's, oh yeah, okay, now. 
sorry, it's just that. So let me just um, say a few words about the Charité. So we are the largest university hospital in Europe. We have uh, 17 centers so that research, teaching and patient care can be better organized. Um, we also have 100 clinics and institutes that work within these centers and cover the entire range of uh, modern medicine. Among of these 17 centers, uh, 13 centers have their focus on patient care and four centers have their fo focus on research and teaching. And as, uh, as you can see, we have four campuses in Berlin and uh, the centers are mostly organized across the locations. Um, there are some facts um, that represent our activities in numbers. I think the most important uh, number in um, this setting is to say that we have more than 4,000 scientists um, and doctors who work over 1,000 projects, working groups, cooperation, and uh, the main goal is to advance the forward-looking developments in the field of medicine with the highest standards of quality and sustainability. And if we're talking about quality, of course, we're proud that the Newsweek ranked us as the fifth um, best hospital of the world and the best hospital in Europe. So um, in case you decide to work with us, at least as the Newsweek said, uh, it's, we're going to be a good partner. Um, so, um, of course, we have uh, we are focusing on some areas, as you can see um, on the slide, uh, where a high priority is given to research areas that offer interdisciplinary approach and close integration of basic and um, clinical research. So as I said, Louise and myself, along with our colleagues, are going to try to support you um, in our best possible way through this project. And we are a part of the Berlin Institute of Health, uh, where our guiding principles are to improve the prediction of progressive disease and uh, development of, of advanced therapies for unmet medical needs. And of course, we provide excellent service and highest quality for the benefit of researchers who are conducting conducting or applying for clinical trials at the Charité. Um, I would also like to say a few words how this partnership started. So the partnership is an outcome of a longstanding cooperation between, uh, between the Charité, the Berlin Institute of Health and the Israel's Trade Office in Berlin. So back in the year 2009, um, the head of uh, the clinical research unit, among others, signed a, a memorandum of understanding, um, which actually stated that exactly this kind of uh, projects and collaborations are going to be supported by the Charité. Um, and there's a quick number that, for example, from the last call, we had four contracts with the IIA-funded startups and a very high um, uh, general satisfaction rate uh, from the PIs. So um, to get further insights of the support that we are going to um, offer, I would like to ask my colleague, Lisa Reuter, to continue with the next slides. Yes, sure. Thank you very much. Hannah, I hope this gave you a good impression about our work and um, what we can offer you as a clinic and as a research, a research center. Um, let's have a look at the focus areas of our call in this year. Um, we are looking for digital, mobile, whatever, medical devices, uh, new technologies um, that are for diagnostic or therapeutic purposes. The areas that we are interested in especially are, for example, the advanced cellular and gene therapy area. Um, they are, no matter if you develop something for popular or rare diseases, we would be interested in new advanced therapies in this area. We are also curious about things that address the patient journey. So patient-centered research, value-based healthcare, and new approaches for prevention and diagnosis. Um, we also love to see medtech with, uh, combined with biological or biotech solutions. That would be very interesting. Um, our special focus is that we would like to set up effective collaborative projects with you. Um, on the next slide, you will see um, that we have two kinds of projects that we can conduct. Here we are. 
The one is the classical research uh, um, that you know and that we see often with uh, also with, with bigger firms. Um, there the contract terms are set. Um, we also can offer something else with, which is called uh, effective cooperation. So this is especially for research and development. Here we are um, we are more free to or we have more freedom to negotiate terms and costs. Um, this is often the basis for a long-term partnership with a PI at Charité. So this would be something um, that we really like to work out with you. And in some cases, uh, we can and we will. Uh, let's have a look at the support that we can offer you. I know time is running, <laughs> I will be quick. Um, of course, we have clinical expertise here, know-how, uh, patient and data access is very important for you. Um, we will match you to the right clinician. We will arrange first meetings. We will be attending uh, pitches together where you can meet possible PIs. Um, we, of course, also prepare a cost overview. Um, in most cases, we are, of course, here in the, the study design and study planning. So um, the cost uh, is a very important factor for you. We will help you with that to get a quick impression. Um, we have an app lab if you need that. We have consultation on the study design. Um, and of course, we supply some kind of a project management um, to see uh, yeah, the, what, what is the framework of the study? What does the PI need? What do you need to, um, to launch the project together? We also have uh, regulatory support in Charité. We have a special service unit for that. And uh, yes, we will, of course, um, guide the milestones that we have together. Yes, this is the in-kind support, so to say. Um, I won't go through all of that. You know the timeline. <laughs> Netta has shown that already. But this is the, the timeline we are looking at. And uh, we are just about to start. And uh, if you have questions concerning the support or the timeline, I think we have time uh, to discuss everything in the end. So thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Hannah and Louisa. And, um, and now I'd like to invite Barry Stein from Hartford Healthcare. Please, Barry. Please unmute. All right. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for um, having and uh, inviting Hartford Healthcare uh, to this uh, uh, webinar today. I very, very much appreciate the opportunity and, and wonderful to be uh, in and amongst uh, the great healthcare organizations around the world. Uh, specifically to, to try and accelerate uh, all these terrific opportunities from Israel uh, to really accelerate their ideas to impact. Um, I'm, I'm going to be sharing a little bit about Hartford Healthcare in a few moments. And I wanted to start off by those that uh, are not familiar with Hartford Healthcare. We are the, uh, the largest integrated healthcare delivery healthcare system in the state of Connecticut, really spread out throughout of the state of Connecticut with multiple hospitals, freestanding imaging centers, uh, multiple institutes, and multiple points of access. Much like Charité, Hartford Healthcare is dedicated to teaching, research, um, and taking care of our patients uh, from the beginning to the end, really fully integrated healthcare delivery service. And just a few uh, statistics, we have 36,000 employees at Hartford Healthcare. We touch 17,000 lives every single day. We are the second largest employer in the state of Connecticut. Uh, and we have over 430 locations across uh, Connecticut um, that really provide all different kinds of care, which we're hoping the startups uh, may be interested in engaging with. So our vision is pretty simple. Um, uh, and, and uh, 
um, our North Star, and that is really to be the most trusted for personalized coordinated care. So everything we do at Hartford Healthcare is focused towards achieving that um, with the following uh, underpinnings. Quality and safety are our imperatives in everything we do. We want to enhance wellness and engagement with our patients as well as our, our clinicians. Improving healthcare access is key. Driving affordability for our community and our patients is key. And of course, ensuring health equity. So that's really the North Star of Hartford Healthcare and really drives some of the, the reasons why we are interested in innovation and some of the, the focus points for our innovation. So how does Hartford Healthcare leverage technology to achieve the vision? And we're hoping that the startups can get a flavor of what it is we do in our approach to innovation and to digital transformation to achieve this, uh, uh, these goals. So we have an innovation layer, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. And that innovation layer allows us to accelerate any great idea uh, to impact. And we're hoping that uh, um, the startups uh, will appreciate that. The second of which is to build a really good foundation layer where all the data lies. This is our approach to really create a very strong foundational layer where we capturing data. The third layer is our intelligence layer where we are turning that data into insights. And then with those insights, we are looking forward to creating connections with our patients to provide precision healthcare to every one of our patients, leveraging the innovation foundation and intelligence layer. And we have a very strong governance layer to make sure that all of this occurs uh, with uh, coordination. So really that's the way we approach innovation, digital transformation at Hartford Healthcare. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the innovation layer to help startups understand the ecosystem that you had been engaged in um, uh, as partners. So our goals of innovation at Hartford Healthcare are to create a frictionless healthcare system, ecosystem, where startups like yourselves can accelerate your ideas to market. We really wanna catalyze a culture that attracts the best entrepreneurs. We wanna create an environment where everybody extracts uh, equal value, and we want to be developing uh, um, jobs for Hartford in the state of Connecticut. So for us to achieve the vision of being the most trusted for personalized coordinated care with these underpinnings, um, the digital health themes that we want to be focusing on are, are digital diagnostics, digital therapeutics, connected care, such as uh, care at home, clinical decision support, and anything related to artificial intelligence and machine learning that drives precision healthcare. So these digital health themes are very much matched towards achieving our vision of being the most trusted for personalized coordinated care. So how are we organized um, within our healthcare system around innovation? Our ecosystem is key. And what we are striving for every day is to make sure that the ecosystem is one that our entrepreneurs uh, can enjoy. Um, and we are sort of catering to our entrepreneurs. We all understand that healthcare systems can be really complex to interact with, multiple buildings, multiple silos. But at Hartford Healthcare, we've actually taken all our assets that we believe that will be important to the startup, such as our research office, our regulatory and compliance office, our clinical institutes, cancer, heart and vascular, neuroscience, bone and joint, behavioral health, urology, our medical groups, our information technology and informatics, and all of that, bring it together in a way that is super efficient for entrepreneurs to engage with, without getting the friction that usually is experienced. And we have hundreds of mentors that are very, very, uh, comfortable and excited to be working with in partnership with the startups to help you develop as well as iterate and validate. So our ecosystem is basically 
primed to really accelerate any startup beyond the value of death and hopefully accelerate your startup to impact. With multiple partners, academic partners such as MIT, multiple partners within the Israel ecosystem, as well as the innovation ecosystem. So our, our ecosystem is primed to help any startup to accelerate. We're interested in the core uh, iterative uh, innovation technologies, adjacent innovation, as well as transformative innovation, all different types at all different stages. And in our organization, when we start to interact, we have a very disciplined approach on how we take any prospective startups such as yourselves through our process with the ultimate goal to make sure that when we engage in partnership with you, we have the full backing and all the resources necessary to make sure that it's an efficient acceleration of any of your ideas to market. And part of our process and our culture is around innovation and iteration to create that innovation loop. So really in summary, for us to achieve this vision, our goals around innovation specifically for this partnership include digital diagnostics, digital therapeutics, anything related to helping us connect with our patients and keep connected with our patients, clinical decision support and AI and ML. And thank you very much. Looking forward to any questions and uh, participation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barry. And um, I see that there are some questions in the chat and some in the Q&A. So you're welcome in the chat. You're welcome to discuss among these yourselves. But if you want us to collect the questions for the Q&A session in the end, please uh, drop them down in the Q&A. OK, so um, and without further ado, uh, Kelly Bragney, from uh, my clinic, please go ahead. Thank you, Neda. I will just uh, find my slides here and share those, which for some reason are not popping up. So much for the test. No pressure. Yeah, <laughs> I apologize. I um, need to locate the slides. They're not showing up as an option. Oh, there we go. And let's do presentation mode. Does that work? Very good. Well, thank you all for inviting us here to, to speak to the, the fantastic number of folks on the webinar today. We're very pleased uh, to be part again of the uh, International Health Tech Collaboration Program. Um, so thank you, Netta and Dror and Alan for including us again. Um, so I'm here to speak about Mayo Clinic. And so for those of you who don't know, Mayo Clinic is a provider of medical education. We have a, a large medical school, or rather a, a small but very focused medical school um, research. We have a large, uh, in this case, research budget. And of course, our clinical practice, which generates you know, a significant revenue, uh, touches millions of patient lives around the world, and has been recognized for seven years in a row now as the number one a uh, hospital per US uh, News and World Reports. Our group um, that I'm part of, and, and my colleague Jackie Armstrong is on the line as well, uh, Mayo Clinic Ventures is the office that manages Mayo's uh, intellectual property portfolio, as well as any relationships that involve co-development or intellectual property or opportunities to work with early stage startup companies like those who might be on the line today. So we're here to you know, continue Mayo's long history of innovation by supporting ideas that are early stage and helping them to develop in advance uh, to the point where they can, again, improve patient care uh, to touch those patients that we reach around the world. So our office has been involved in this activity since they're late 1980s, 1986, and we are approaching um, the $1 billion in revenue returned to Mayo Clinic to support our mission, which is again, to provide uh, education, research, and of course, patient care. So in terms of how we expect or would like to engage with companies under this program, 
Um, we are focused on the R&D collaboration aspect as opposed to the pilot um, program. So we're really interested in co-development opportunities, which we oftentimes refer to as know-how agreements, where we engage a clinical or research expert um, to work hand in glove with the company in developing some aspect of the pipeline of products and services that the company is focused on. Um, we do this um, many times. We do about 150 agreements every year and probably half of those are of this flavor. Um, and when we have those types of IP-based or co-development relationships with the company, it opens the door for us to consider investment opportunities. So we manage through our office a collection of angel investment funds. We have probably somewhere between 20 and $30 million under management in those funds. And then we also have a $250 million venture co-investment fund so that when you know, we advance to the point or rather the company does that they're raising a series A or series B with a qualified lead investor, we can consider co-investment as well. So we have a continuum of opportunities from very early stage, you know, code development with Mayo Clinic experts and, and champions, um, as well as potentially some additional funding that are specific even to Israeli companies. One of our funds is, is focused on that. And then uh, as projects develop and the company uh, continues to grow, we have the opportunity to consider venture co-investment as well. In terms of the areas that we're interested in, again, because we're focused on co-development opportunities with Mayo experts, it's really anything that we have a Mayo expert that's engaged and interested in working with what you're uh, developing. And so that could include much like um, Hartford, you know, our digital uh, focused technologies. We have uh, what's called Mayo Clinic Platform, which is how we're participating in and helping to lead the digital transformation that's occurring in healthcare. Um, so we have access to data through that uh, mechanism. We're also, of course, interested in devices across surgery and any other area where we have a, a Mayo champion that's willing to, to work with you on developing new solutions in, in that sector. Of course, diagnostics as well. Um, Mayo Clinic has an esoteric lab testing capability, and so we're interested in traditional diagnostics as well as, you know, um, forward-thinking diagnostics that include algorithms and clinical decision support tools that may be digital. Um, and then finally, of course, we're also interested in therapeutics. Um, we have a center for regenerative biotherapeutics that's focused on cell and gene therapies. But again, any uh, healthcare-related um, technology that we have a Mayo Clinic expert that's interested in you know, is fair game for how we would consider uh, doing these R&D collaborations. Um, I will stop there and be very short today. So thank you very much for the time. Thank you very much, Kelly. Um, next up, I'll ask Ben Marty from the Northern Health Science Alliance, the NHSA in the UK, to share with us. Thank you. Thanks, Netta. Uh, there we go. Hopefully everyone can see that. So, um, Thanks everyone for, for joining the webinar today. And um, I just want to say we're really delighted to be joining this program for the first time this year. And, and thanks to Netta and the, and the team at the IA for, for working with us and, and bringing this all together. So uh, I'm Ben Martin and I'm from the Northern Health Science Alliance, the NHSA. Uh, and I represent a health partnership for the North of England, which is uh, that section uh, of, the, of the UK. So we have uh, 24 members, 10 universities, 10 NHS trusts, which we'll talk about a bit more in some detail in a bit, and four academic health science networks, which are uh, like market access and innovation arm of the, of the NHS, the National Health Service here in the UK. Uh, and we represent all of those members uh, as one of the largest uh, life science clusters in the UK and, and uh, part of the UK life science cluster, which is one of the largest in the world. So to give you a, an overview of the, the region that we represent, we have a, a population of 17 million. Uh, we cover roughly just under two, twice the square kilometres of Israel. Uh, we have a very uh, broad mix of urban and remote populations. 
Uh, and the North as a separate country would be the 10th largest uh, economy in Europe. Uh, last we did the data on this. Um, and our members uh, came together 10 years ago uh, to represent that life science cluster. So we have uh, we had 130,000 graduates in from life science subjects every year. Uh, they bring in well over a billion pounds of uh, annual research income. Our trusts together employ over 150,000 staff uh, and turn over six billion. Uh, and the AHSNs in the last year worked with a thousand SMEs uh, and generated 123 million pounds for those companies by working with them uh, and getting those innovations into the NHS. Uh, and that uh, public sector that we represent drives a, a very strong uh, life science private sector. So we have over a thousand businesses, uh, lots of uh, world class science innovation parks, lots of um, life science specialist service companies, uh, IP lawyers and, and so on. Uh, and the region as a whole is is highly skilled and, and, and growing year on year. So I am um, going to give a very, very quick high level overview of the members that are leading calls within this. So everyone who is a member of the NHSA is, is uh, contributing to uh, the process that we're running with the IA, but our seven of our NHS trusts are leading particular calls and have identified core areas that they are interested in looking for innovation in. And I wanna make the point on this slide very briefly that uh, if you're not familiar with an NHS trust, uh, it's a healthcare site centre. They manage more than one site, and many of our trusts have multiple hospitals. Uh, I think we've got 32 hospitals participating in total. And also, uh, one of the members involved, Rotherham Doncaster in South Humber, isn't an acute services uh, hospital, it's a uh, mental health trust and delivers community services across 200 sites and has reached through our network across the whole of the north. Uh, so there's a, a, a real offer of scale that we hope to bring to the table. So I'm now going to very quickly run through the seven uh, in, in very high level, but there is obviously more information being made available on the IA website. And I would say that all of these organizations are massive healthcare centers that do almost every clinical specialty and are interested in almost every technology, but they have picked out key areas that they're particularly interested in. Uh, so uh, Newcastle uh, treats about 2 million patients a year. They turn over a billion pounds. They're very well known internationally for pioneering mitochondrial donation and CAR T cell therapies. So very interested in seven gene therapies. They host a number of uh, national, nationally significant research centers um, uh, for the UK, um, particularly with a focus on diagnostics and long-term conditions. Next up is uh, Sheffield, which is my hometown where I am now. Uh, again, another very large teaching hospital trust uh, with multiple sites, uh, with a long history of uh, med tech design and manufacturing experience, hosting um, the National Advanced Manufacturing Centre, for example, uh, and also a lot of history with uh, sports and wellbeing and neuro neurology research as well. Uh, next up is Hull. Uh, which covers a very large uh, section of the country with some uh, strong urban, like large cities, but then a lot of rural populations. Uh, and they do unfortunately cover a lot of um, demographics with significant health inequalities. So that's something of particular interest to them. Uh, they've uh, partly driven by that need to access hard to reach patients, invested a lot into digital and AI um, healthcare delivery. Uh, and uh, are very interested in any digital technologies that let them reach patients remotely. Uh, next up is Rotherham, Doncaster and South Humber. So they're one of our mental health trusts. They deliver adult and children's services across 200 community sites. Uh, they lead the NHSA mental health network. So they have access across the whole region and beyond. Uh, and one of their uh, key specialties is actually the ability to deliver healthcare focused research in non healthcare settings, uh, such as prisons and schools and, and workplaces. 
Um, and then they also have a, a internationally recognized uh, research departments in burnout prevention, psychotherapy, physiology research, and other areas. Uh, next up is Liverpool. Uh, again, another really big site. They've decided to really focus their um, sort of a call for proposals within this program around their head and neck cancer alliance that they run and they have a, a leading head and neck cancer center. Um, so particularly interested in uh, genomics, metabolics, imaging, uh, use of AI in those fields, uh, and also their Center for Clinical Eye Research. And again, uh, lots of imaging, genomics, precision medicine within those, those two areas. And there's more information uh, available on the, on the IA website. Uh, and then next up is Manchester. Uh, Manchester is uh, one of the largest healthcare providers in Europe um, and one of the largest in the UK. Uh, they've pioneered multiple first in the world treatments and they host more multiple national centres of excellence than I can list right now. Uh, and they've uh, focused very much on um, diagnost their diagnostics research, their uh, workforce there and um, genomics, AI, digital health medical devices. Uh, and last but not least uh, is Leeds Teaching Hospital Trust, which again uh, treat one and a half million patients a year. They're also one of the largest providers of healthcare in Europe and, and the UK, and it's not for me to decide which one is larger, I'll let them fight it out. But um, one of the key drivers for innovation at Leeds at the moment is two new uh, digital first hospitals are being built in the city. Uh, and so they're very interested in finding new innovation that they can implement into those buildings as they come online. Uh, and I should also mention that the Leeds Trust hosts uh, what's called the Leeds Israel Health Tech Gateway, which is an initiative within the city to bring together all of the key pieces of infrastructure that uh, can support an Israeli SME to come and work, do research and set up um, offices or lab space in the city region, uh, working together to provide that as a service. So the last thing that I just want to mention, because I know I'm a little bit over time, is uh, if you want to know a bit more about key priorities within the UK National Health Service, there are two sort of key resources that I can point you at. So one is this core 20 plus five uh, program for reducing healthcare inequalities, and the other is the NHS long term plan. And you can see a lot of information about where the UK market is headed based on those two documents. Uh, so thanks again. Here's mine and my colleagues. Uh, contact details that we'll be working with the companies uh, to guide them through the process. Thanks, Nata. Great, thank you so much, Ben. Um, and I remind you that all of this information will be shared with you after the webinar, as well as the links to our postal proposals and in Hebrew and English, for, which are on our website. Um, so last, but certainly not least, I'd like to invite Zvi Grunwald from Thomas Jefferson University Hospital Please to be and Alan will be sharing the slides for this. We are supposed to be seeing the video. Yeah, if you can run the slides and Ellen, you can hit the first one. Thank you.
this was a historic and exciting moment at Cape Canaveral, watching the launch of Axiom 1 mission to the International Space Station on April 8, with Eitan Steve, the Israeli astronaut. The sight, the sound, and the heat wave were incredible. Jefferson is strongly tied to this project. Shalom, everybody. My name is Sve Grunwald. I am the executive director of the Jefferson Israel Center. And it is my pleasure introducing Dr. Adam Dicker, Enterprise Senior Vice President, Professor and Chair of Radiation Oncology, and the Director of Jefferson Center for Digital Health and Data Science. We are from Thomas Jefferson University and Jefferson Health in Philadelphia. We're excited to see you all and happy to introduce you to Jefferson. Next slide, please. Jefferson is, show, is showing a trajectory of tremendous growth in the last nine years, as you can see here. Our revenue has grown to more than $9 billion. Jefferson is more than 42,000 people strong, providing the highest quality compassionate clinical care for patients and preparing tomorrow professional leaders for the, first, for the 21st century careers, discovering new treatments to define the future of care. The 200-year-old Thomas Jefferson University comprises of 10 colleges and teaches more than 8,000 students. Jefferson Health serves patients through millions of encounters in its 18 hospitals. Jefferson Health is one of the fastest growing academic medical centers in the US. It is number one in our region in clinical market share. Next slide, please. The Jefferson Israel Center builds on a year of academic collaborations and developing meaningful relationship between Jefferson physicians and leading institutions in Israel. Jefferson has also signed Memorandum of Understanding, Ms. Kare Havana, with major academic centers, major medical centers, and the Israel Innovation Authority. In 2017, Jefferson merged with Philadelphia University and we've been able to go into specialties like architecture, design, and textile. Imagine a merger between Hebrew University, Sheba Medical Center, Bezalel, and Shankar. This is Jefferson. The similarities between the innovation ecosystem in Israel and Jefferson are generating productive collaborations, exemplified by the display of a few of the companies you can see here. Our system DNA is similar. Professor Marty Kaczynski, president of the university, has launched a car startup company in Israel, deploying his fusion molecule to cure cancer. We launched Animus, a company in, working in a diabetes space in my department of anesthesiology. The company was bought by Johnson & Johnson for $100 million in 2006. So Professor Tikachinsky and I represent Startup Nation at Jefferson. The special collaboration project with Sheba and the Israel Innovation Authorities will be highlighted in the next few slides. Next slide, so we have the slide on. So you can see that Ethan Steve, the Israel astronaut, conducted 35 scientific experiments on board the International Space Station. Three projects were led by scientists from Thomas Jefferson University and Sheba. They employed groundbreaking technologies developed by startup companies from Israel and abroad. The project aimed to assist future space travelers and the society here on Earth. They covered urinary microbiome, the immune system, and stress during flight, space flight. Next slide, please. The Vicky and Jack Faber Institute for Neuroscience at Jefferson is one of the best of its kind and opened recently a sister institution in Gemelli Hospital in Rome. Last week, as you can see in the picture, a delegation led by, led by a leadership from Jefferson Center launched the Neuroscience Center at Shiba. Our vision is to creating a network of neuroscience centers with global distinction. We hope 
that this center will be a beacon of neuroscience excellence, benefiting the societies in Israel and the Middle East. Next slide, please. The Israel Innovation Authority and Jefferson participated in launching two pilot programs, the inauguration one in 2019 and in 2020. The premise was that the Israel Innovation Authority will provide funds to a company so they can develop the product from proof of concept to validation and up to commercialization. One and a half million dollars were available to eight companies carefully selected during these two rounds. Two, two companies started early, three had a delayed start, but three companies failed. Leading causes for failure <clears throat> were underfunding and changes at the leadership of the companies. Companies did well when we identified and they identified local champions who shook hands, worked closely, created good communication. It is very important to note that all this happened because of a strong support by all members of the Israel Innovation Authorities. This was critically important during the COVID active phase of the pandemic. So, Draw, Alan, Neta, and Neely. Thank you so much. Todaraba, Mikola Lev. Next slide, please. <clears throat> We're inviting you to collaborate with us in the following areas. As you can read here, and it stays, so you can look later. Technologies to support hospital at home, hospital with no address. Of course, in neuroscience area, on a basic science, brain computer interface, stem cell, exosomes, and on a clinical size, epilepsy, headache, uh, and Parkinson movement disorder, dementia, NMS. Mobility solution and mobile health, health information technology, clinical decision support and team management, telehealth, digital prevention, diagnosis, treatment, and rehabilitation, and biomaterials. So this webinar with a strong presence of the innovation industry in Israel speaks volume that we have embarked on the right track. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Thank you. So we all have a lot to think about, but next up, I'd like to invite you our teacher from Health IL, Israel's healthcare innovation ecosystem, to provide us all with some relevant tips on how to build a successful collaboration with Thank you. Yeah. Hi, thank you everybody. I'm going to share my screen. Um, great. Can everyone see? Yeah? Not yet. Not yet. Take it part to share. Now, yes. Great. Okay. So I have a short amount of time and a lot to cover. Um, I'll begin at the high level. Health AL is an organization that works on, uh, on the complexity and the challenges and the issues of integrating innovation into healthcare. We all know it is extremely challenging, and our approach is to kind of unpack these challenges from all perspective in order to understand how to best foster innovation and how to integrate it. Um, we do this in three ways. The first is that we really build the infrastructure for innovation management as a practical tool and as a practical practice within healthcare organizations. From this, this leads to actual effective collaborations uh, between healthcare organizations and startups. Um, and at the highest level, we need to think about policy and infrastructure and regulation affects this, which is how we also try to uh, kind of wrap this from the governmental perspective. Um, high level numbers, we have over 1,100 startups in our system uh, at all stages. We really try to help everyone. Uh, we work with every single healthcare organization here in Israel, more and more broad. Uh, and we have been part and parcel of over 800 different types of collaborations at all stages since we began. We do a bunch of stuff over the course of the year. I won't get into details of this, but they fall into three main categories. Uh, obviously, supporting the innovation professionals and with 
founders with education and training about best practices. Uh, a lot of these are tools that we built, both qualitative and quantitative. Uh, we look to transform the system by addressing regulation, policy, and infrastructure and what can help and what uh, may hinder. And at the end of the day, this is all to build and scale innovation in healthcare. Um, it's the integration, all of these things foster some uh, uh, traction, both for the healthcare systems themselves and also for the startups. So what are we talking about today? Today, we're talking about how to effectively create meaningful collaborations in healthcare, uh, specifically between healthcare systems and healthcare organizations um, and startups. This is an extremely complex topic, uh, has lots of moving parts. As I stated, um, we thrive on unpacking this complexity in these moving parts. So I, I wanna kind of share with you what we've learned over the years at the highest level. Um, I'm gonna try to speak to both sides. Uh, health orgs and startups, again, based on our experience. And this is just a taste of it. Pretty much everything you'll see is, is in and of itself just a lecture. So at the highest level, there are three kind of steps that we wanna look at. We wanna find a prime, try to find a practical way to move from an initial meeting to some form of initial collaboration to some form of implementation. And how do you transition from one to the other? This first step that we'll get into detail has kind of four parts to it at the very highest level. Um, the prerequisites before you even begin, uh, that challenge and solution fit, how to assess, and how to create some form of structure for that collaboration, right? And collaboration can be anything from research and observational study all the way to pre-commercialization trials. So um, the prerequisites come from both sides, right? Uh, and these are things that we feel that health organizations and startups need to consider individually before attempting to foster some form of collaboration. Health orgs really need to think about their strategies and goals, uh, but also their value add, which means how they can actually operate, uh, what they do and what they cannot do, right? They also need to think about their economic incentives, what really moves the needle for them. Um, and finally, they need to think about the resources. What can they bring to the table for something like this? And what can they not bring to the table? And how do you define a resource, right? A resource can be money, it can be access to data, it can be KOLs, it can be systems, it can be mainframes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Startups also have a lot of homework to do from there. First, they need to understand the economic, economic motivation uh, of who they wanna work with, right? The business of an ASD in the US is going to be radically different than the business of VHI in Germany, for example. And you need to know this before you get into these collaborations. Um, and of course, you need to understand the trends that are going on in your specific niche and how you fit into that. What is the offering about where these trends are going in the future? And finally, you also need to think about the resources you need to keep moving and progressing, right? This relates to the stage of the company that you're in. So all these prerequisites, get translated into these challenges and solutions. Uh, we heard a bunch of interests and stuff like that. Um, and we at Health Air are very, very disciplined about how we approach this. Uh, in practice, this, this step of actually creating a challenge is much more complex, right? It's easy to say, well, this is what we're interested in and let's go find a solution, right? Um, the reality is that health organizations should translate these strategies and goals into an actual concrete, tangible challenge that needs a solution. The way they operate and the resources they have or don't have can already create effectively a solution framework. This means what the potential solution can look like, right? And health organizations can already kind of formulate this beforehand. Um, and finally, the resources, what they have and don't have, they can already kind of assess what the other side needs to bring to sit to the table in order to create a successful collaboration. Startups need to do the same. Their offering is the solution, right? And their value proposition. And what resources they need will dictate the type of collaboration they want to do. Now, here's the key. These things are aligned. Obviously, the, ch the challenge should match the solution. But the solution framework that the health organization has the back has in the back of their mind should also match the value proposition of the startup. And the resource gap that the health organization has, meaning how they operate, should match the collaboration preference of the startup. 
Next, assessing the potential solution, right? We see five factors to assess at this point. And this point, the focus here really is going to be on the actual healthcare aspects of it, right? Obviously, you can think about the money and whatever, but let's just talk about the health. Um, we see kind of five main big areas um, that health organization needs to assess, right? And again, this is with regards to a specific predefined challenge. It is the responsibility of the startup to demonstrate value according to these five things, again, with regard to the specific challenge, right? Or in this case of the startup, the actual solution. After we do this and we find something that both sides like and can work together, then we can move on to building an actual structure for a collaboration. Now, collaboration, again, is very wide, right? There's different types of collaborations, but at the highest level, each and every one of them has some scope of this work, of this project. It has to have a framework. It has to have some type of, of defined execution. And then you can even start talking about post-collaboration, right? So, I do want to point out a couple things that are really, really, really critical to remember at this point, right? There are different types of products. Different types of products will have different considerations across this chain. And as we said, there's different types of collaboration. Different types of collaborations will have different considerations as well. And also that there are multiple stakeholders that both sides need to think about. Right? It's not just the innovation lead. It's not just the head of a department. It is also legal and IT and procurement and maybe the CFO and a bunch of other factors. And both sides need to be aware of the motivations and the operations of these different stakeholders. Um, I just want to give you an example about this, for example. This is a tool that we built. Uh, or it's part of a much larger tool that we built for every hospital here in Israel. It is effectively a massive Excel that goes through the two slides we just saw about the assessment and building collaboration framework, and it is a big, fat, massive checklist. You can see here that this is just the innovation lead and what they need to look at based on the type of collaboration. Now, this is also going to change or add another layer if we think about the different types of product, right? A purely software device is going to have different con considerations than something that is hardware only or implantable. Or is it a short-term implantable or a temporary implantable or a long-term implantable? This same thing we built out for the legal department and for the IT department, each one of them, right? Because each one of them has different aspects that they're looking at when you're doing the collaboration. So let's move a little bit further down the chain, right? And let's talk about the stage between initial collaboration and actual implementation. This is where money comes in largely, right? This is where that situation between, okay, we have a funded collaboration or semi-funded collaboration, whatever it may be, all of a sudden you need to start talking about who's going to pay for these things. Um, I will not get into details about this because each line item here is a whole separate lecture, but I will point out that both sides have things that they need to consider, right? A hospital really needs to think about the switching costs, right? They obviously have something that they're using already. How painful is it going to be to move into something else? The onboarding costs of this. And where's the budget for something like this actually is going to, co is actually going to come from? Startups obviously need to focus on validating what they're building economically, right? You need to be able to speak the same language as a hospital, whether it's return on investment, cost neutrality, however it's defined. And for that reason, you really need to think about the monetization mechanisms, right? Maybe it's reimbursement, maybe it's something else, and also about the fiscal time horizons whereby the healthcare organization can see some level of cost neutrality. So in summary, uh, the two things, the two main takeaways I want to give both sides here that we've seen in all of our experience um, are as such. First, the prerequisites are critical. Um, it's really important before you go into these things, if you want to foster an effective collaboration, that both sides need to come prepared. Uh, we've experienced at HealthAil many, many, many situations where things fall after just an initial meeting because one side or another has not done their homework, 
Sometimes the healthcare organization wants to progress, but actually does not have the data that is necessary to progress, right? In other situations, a startup wants to progress, but they haven't done their homework and they're on, they don't know what they actually need from the hospital. The other areas where we see uh, kind of a gap in, in creating is in addressing multiple stakeholders. And here again, we see it from both sides. I highly encourage healthcare organizations to loop in legal, NIT, and procurement, and whatever at earlier stages. These things can sometimes have a very noticeable effect on creating collaborations. From the startups, this is critical. Um, and, you know, I've seen this time and time and time and time again. Um, startups really need to understand how their product affects various stakeholders, both those who touch your product directly, but also those who touch your product indirectly. And remember, at the end of the day, a successful collaboration needs to have some form of mutual contribution from both sides. But more than that, it needs to have a clearly defined mutual benefit to both sides. So that at the highest level is what we've seen. Again, uh, I'm touching at this very, very, very high level. Happy to go in depth with anybody. Uh, if you're interested in this, every single one of these, we have a, really look to create a practical framework for addressing every one of these steps. Um, so if there's any questions, whatnot, feel free to reach out to me. This is my email um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Informative session, and I'm sure we have a lot of food for thought for everyone. And, and luckily, we'll have you with us throughout the uh, course of this collaboration project to uh, provide some insights uh, based on your experience. Um, so, next up, uh, we are getting closer to the end. Uh, we're going to have a short session in Hebrew, so our international partners bear with us, please. It's just very short. Um, we will have uh, Mirit Lari from the Israel Innovation Authority's Business Operations Team uh, providing some very practical information to our participants as to what to do next, how to submit your uh, application to the first stage to be considered for this program. Um, as uh, Mirit, just to say that after Mirit, we will have a, a short QA session. Okay, so again, you'll um, you can write more. I have some questions already in the Q&A. Uh, if anyone is interested, write some more. I'm not sure we can reach all of them, but we'll try. Um, maybe. Let's run the message. Yes. 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 רפרנטית של החטיבה הבינלאומית, ואני בעצם ממש בקצרה אסביר על אופן הגשת הבקשה. בעצם זה מתחלק לשלב הראשון של הבקשה המקדמית ולשלב השני של הבקשה המלאה, כרגע נתמקד בבקשה הראשונה, בשלב הראשון. ובכל מקרה המצגת תישלח בסוף הוובינר לכל המשתתפים, ככה שתהיה גישה לכל המידע ולכל הלינקים. כן, אז השלב הראשון של הגשת הבקשה המקדמית הדדליין הוא 14 בנובמבר ו-12 בצהריים, ממש חשוב להקפיד על הדדליין כי אנחנו לא נוכל לקלוט בקשות שמתקבלות אחרי ומומלץ באופן כללי להגיש לפחות יום לפני כדי להימנע מעיכובים מיותרים במערכת. אז בשלב הראשון המסמך שנדרש להגיש זה מסמך ה-EOI, Express of Interest, כמו שדיברתם בעצם זה מסמך של עד שישה עמודים, זה די קצר ויש בו שאלות מובנות שצריך לענות עליהן אפשר להוריד אותו בעמוד של הקול הקורא וגם מהמצגת ברגע שתישלח. אם מגישים בקשה לשיתוף פעולה עם כמה בתי חולים, אז צריך EOI לכל אחד מהבתי חולים בנפרד. איך מגישים את הבקשה? אז קודם כל צריך להירשם באזור האישי של, של הרשות. אחרי שנרשמים וצריך להיכנס שוב ולבחור בהגשת בקשה לתמיכה, שם אתם תידרשו למלא נתונים על החברה ועל הבקשה. ‫בטופס המקוון, ככה זה נראה במערכת. ‫בתחילת ההגשה במערכת המקוונת, ‫אתם תצטרכו לבחור מסלול ‫שאליו אתם מגישים את הבקשה, ‫אז אתם בוחרים קרנות דו-לאומיות פרד אף, ‫וכשתגיעו ובח... לחלק של הוספת הצרופות, ‫אתם תידרשו להוסיף גם טופס וורד ‫וגם אקסל. ‫עכשיו, בחלק של הטופס וורד, ‫בבקשת המו"פ, אתם מצרפים את ה-EOI שכבר הורדתם ומילאתם מראש ובחלק של תקציב בקשת עמוד 
אתם מעלים אקסל ריק, הסיבה לכך זה שטופס המקוון הוא בעצם גנרי, ובדרך כלל אלו שני מסמכי חובה, בגלל שזה השלב הראשון, לא נדרש טופס אקסל, לכן אתם מעלים אותו ריק אה, כרגע. מה שקורה אחרי זה, זה הבקשה נקלטת במערכת ועוברת לבדיקה מקצועית, אחרי זה כל המידע עובר לבתי החולים. הם בעצם בוחרים את הפרויקטים הנבחרים שעוברים לשלב הבא והחברות שיבחרו בשלב הראשון יוכלו להגיש את הבקשה המלאה כמו שאן אמר ביוני, יוני 23 זה הדדליין והתפרסם גם קול קורא ייעודי לכך. השלב השני זה השלב של הגשת הבקשה המלאה, יוני 23, וזה שוב למי שעבר את השלב הראשון, זה כדי לאישור מבתי החולים. אוקיי, okay, לפני שמכינים את הבקשה השנייה, את הבקשה המלאה, אנחנו ממש מנסים בחום לקרוא את כל הלינקים האלה, את הקול הקורא שהתפרסם, את דף המצלול, את נוהל יישום הסכמים בינלאומיים, הוראת מסלול הטבע מספר אחת. ואת נהלי הרשות, הם בעצם מרכזים את כל, ה... את כל התנאים וכל ההנחיות לכתיבת בקשה מלאה. דף המסלול גם מרכז את כל הלינקים האלו, ואנחנו באמת ממליצים לקרוא בעיון את כל, ה... את כל המידע כאן, כי זה יעלה את סיכויי ההצלחה. ובכל אופן, אנחנו נקיים וובינר בהמשך למי שעלה... שעבר את השלב הראשון, וזה יהיה רלוונטי לו השלב השני של הגשת הבקשה המלאה. אם יש לכם שאלות שקשורות לנהלי המסלול ולהגשה של הבקשה, אתם מוזמנים לפנות אלינו למחלקת קליטה במייל הזה. לשאלות שקשורות לתוכנית עצמה, אפשר לפנות לחטיבה הבינלאומית במייל שמופיע פה. ואם צריך סיוע טכני במערכת המקוונת, זה כבר מערך הלקוחות עם המידע הזה. וזהו, אני חושבת, לשלב הזה, שיהיה בהצלחה לכולם. תודה רבה, מיבי. Thank you very much. Um... So we had the session in Hebrew so as to make it kind of more um, direct for the Hebrew speakers amongst us, but the application, it's, it's important to clarify that the application is going to be in English. The full information exists on our website in English. It's been, uh, the link has been sent here in the chat various times and it will also be sent to you um, in a follow-up email following the webinar and you can also look it up online uh, and find it relatively easy, okay? So hopefully, We didn't uh, scare off anyone who speaks Hebrew. Um, and now uh, we'll have a short uh, Q&A session. So um, we had some uh, questioning questions here. Uh, here, so I'll read them. And then um, some of them are aimed at us, and I'll answer them, and some of them at the hospitals. Um, so uh, Itzik Levy asked if it's, if it's as possible to suggest another uh, medical center that is not presented here for a joint uh, pilot. So it's important to mention that this call is, uh, we work very hard on establishing the, the collaboration uh, with our existing partners. We value their partnership and this call is aimed directly at uh, partnering with them. If you have um, you know, any queries, you're welcome to reach out to us and we'll see if there are many, may, maybe other uh, uh, channels for funding that would be relevant for you, but it's important to mention that this call is uh, uh, targeted at, at uh, collaborations with our uh, partners. Um, and uh, another question from Paolo was about, uh, does the IA require the hospitals to get into a business relationship with the startups that successfully completed the pilot with them? So this is also important to mention that we are focusing here on uh, either R&D or pilot projects. There is no commitment on either side. You know, if, if uh, and hopefully the, the, the pilot is successful and both sides are interested to continue onto a, 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 another sort of collaboration, we will obviously uh, welcome it, but it's not a prerequisite and the hospitals are not committed to it. Uh, so that's important uh, to mention. Uh, Jacob asked if there is an IA program at the Israel Innovation Authority program that is only for uh, R&D or piloting or can it be used for uh, testing for a FDA regulatory clearance. So again, uh, the focus here is on R&D and piloting um, and you can continue on afterwards. And if the hospitals are interested, they, they would provide additional support, uh, but we are focusing on a slightly earlier stage. Um, 
Another question was about uh, the funding. Who gets the funding? How does the funding work? So I'll say a few words for that. Um, the beneficiary, from our point of view, is the Israeli company. The Israeli company is the one that is applying to us. The Israeli company is the one who is going to receive our funding. Um, a part of that funding, as I mentioned in the beginning of the webinar, uh, in the case of a pilot project, can be used to uh, fund activities, services provided by the healthcare uh, partner. Um, and uh, then the Israeli company would receive, again, that funding from us and would then use it to pay uh, the hospital. So uh, we don't um, uh, pass uh, our funding to the hospitals directly. If you have additional questions, I know this is a little bit tricky. We have very specific regulations. If you have additional questions, uh, feel free to reach out to us about this. Um, then let's go on to questions about uh, for a, 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 our health uh, part. So Tom is asking, I've not heard anything about blockchain in health. I wonder if it's a feature or a bug in the Israeli startup ecosystem. So anyone wants to uh, answer if you're interested in, in blockchain in health? Barry, I see that you were typing an answer. Do you want to respond? Um, I wasn't going to answer, but seeing that you called me, blockchain's always of interest. Clearly, blockchain has a future in healthcare. Um, I think, at least in the the U.S. healthcare system, at least from my perspective, we're still trying to work out the exact problem that blockchain will help us solve. So, if there's any startup out there that uh, is leveraging blockchain to solve specific problems, at least that are of interest to our healthcare system, would love to hear more about it. Great, thank you. Um, uh, let's see what else. Uh, so we had a question from Amnon to my clinic. Um, you mentioned this, but just to clarify, you accept only shared IP projects, right? You are interested in co-development. Our different partners have different uh, desires. So, uh, Kelly, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, so certainly there are opportunities to work with Mayo Clinic on sponsored clinical trials or, you know, standard research collaborations. Um, and to the extent that folks were interested in that, they certainly can pursue those. It just would not involve our office or us working on you know finding the appropriate KOLs and, and helping to facilitate the project because our group, Mayo Ventures, is very specifically focused on co-development opportunities. And so I know there's a lot of companies that will be applying and we really have to focus on the R&D collaborations through our group. But um, to the extent you have connections with other PIs outside of working through Mayo Ventures, it's not that we wouldn't ever do those. It's just that they're not the focus of our activities and they will not offer the opportunity for co-investment or anything related to our office. So it limits the resources that we can bring to bear um, and which is why we're specifically focused on the R&D projects. Thank you, Kelly. So um, there was a question of, uh, can we please elaborate on the financial support uh, for the uh, pilot collaboration, what are the limitations? So again, I mentioned that we didn't have a specific cap for the amount of funding. Um, the, our projects can go from uh, uh, one to three years. Again, it will all depend on the sort of uh, agreement you reach with the hospital. Since we have different partners here, they would have uh, different needs, different requirements, different interests. Uh, I know this is a, a little bit challenging, for, but for that reason, we are also enabling you to um, apply um, with specific with different EOI to uh, uh, various um, uh, of our partners, uh, various uh, uh, health centers, and they would evaluate your interest, and then uh, you could, you know, uh, try to work and, and see with whom you would reach the, the, the best uh, uh, match. I will say uh, that Ben presented the NHSA. The NHSA is a network of hospitals, so when you apply. Um, to the NHSA, you apply once, and then Ben and his team would help you uh, connect to all of the different uh, uh, members in this network that we presented, okay? So that is uh, one application to the all of the NHSA, and for our other partners would be um, 
one each. Um, another question was, do the health uh, healthcare partner get funding from their local immigration body? So, no, um, it would be great, but <laughs> that didn't, it, it didn't work out um, that way. So for that reason, um, um, the, the health centers are not receiving additional funding. We are providing funding to the Israeli company. And as I said, as a, if it's a pilot project, we can, uh, some of that funding can be allocated toward uh, uh, paying for the services of the, the health center. But definitely, this is a challenge. We are aware of this. We want to be very clear about this based on our past experience where we weren't clear enough and then there were gaps and challenges. And we want to, um, you know, make sure that the companies that apply now understand uh, that this is the framework um, and hopefully uh, you will find, uh, you know, the, the, the best way um, uh, to collaborate and to make this uh, program possible. Um, let's see if I can see other questions here. Um, so many people are asking about specific uh, subsectors, so uh, specific technologies and ask me if you're interested in them. I think uh, we won't get into that. I think I did uh, do that with the, um, with the blockchain, but um, the health centers did have time to present their interest. And if they didn't uh, touch upon the interest, the, the specific subject sector that you are uh, uh, looking for, then uh, I guess it's not higher in their priority, but you can still, um, you can still try. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, is do does anyone want to add anything? Um, any, any of our partners? <clears throat> we have um, two more minutes, so uh, do we need to form a connection with specific partner? Prior, okay, this is a good question, Dovi. Do you need to form a connection with a specific partner at the specific health healthcare center prior to the EOI submission? No, the way you start the application process is by submitting submitting the EOI. Then we are then uh, evaluating the EOIs and passing on that information to the health centers and they shortlist um, the, the companies according to their needs, their interests. Um, so the way to, to engage and the way to start the process and to be considered for funding is through applying uh, with the EOI. Uh, it's not through uh, now, you know, starting to reach out directly to all of the uh, health centers that would be creating a lot of confusion. What we try to do here is to create a streamlined process that would enable this sort of matchmaking in a more organized manner. I know that we are, I'm also Israeli, we don't like that that much, but uh, we are doing our best to, to create this sort of structure. Uh, and this would be uh, very useful for the hospitals because otherwise, uh, it could be a bit uh, daunting. And, uh, so I, I do encourage you um, to read about the hospitals, the health centers. Uh, we will share their slides. Uh, their uh, information is on the website and the links that we shared here again and again, and we will share again. Um, so you'll be able to you know, acquire as much information as you can before you're submitting the EOI. And then uh, again, you can submit various EOIs and Hopefully, it will be a good match. Um, unfortunately, we can't. Uh, our time is up, so we can't go on to ask to answer any more questions. But um, our information, uh, contact information, is in the the, the links. Uh, we will follow up with an email with all of this information in the next few days, and you'll be able to ask us all the questions if you have any specific questions. So I want to. Really thank again all of our partners uh, for this great partnership. We're very excited and we're looking forward to receiving all these and reading all these great applications. Thank you to all the participants and uh, have a great evening.